I'd like to just begin by welcoming everyone um, who is here with us this evening. Um, my name is Sandra Hebron. I'm Head of Screen Arts at the National Film and Television School. And it's my very great pleasure to be hosting this second NFTS Backstories event in partnership with the BFI. Um, NFTS Backstories will be a series of masterclasses and Q and A's and conversations that we'll be um, hosting with alumni of the NFTS through the course of the coming year as the school celebrates its 50th anniversary. Um, and of course, it's a huge, uh, as those of you who heard our initial exchange, um, it's a huge personal and professional pleasure to welcome writer-director Terence Davis, who joins us this evening. Um, I think Terence probably needs very little by way of introduction, but I'll, I'll give a short one and hope that it's not too, it's always a strange thing <laughs> sitting next to a person who is talking about you. Um, but of course, Terence is routinely described as one of Britain's greatest living filmmakers. Um, I think frankly, by now we should scrap the British part of that and just acknowledge that Terence is one of our greatest living filmmakers. Um, because I feel that as a filmmaker, um, Terence, you really are unique, not just in Britain, but internationally. Um, Terence, of course, has made a, a, a number of very poetic and affecting stories of human relationships, whether the semi-autobiographical uh, films from the earlier part of his career or the more recent films often adapted from literary sources or reflecting on the lives of real people. Um, and all of these, and so too the personal reflective of time and the city, I think draw us in as viewers, as audiences, through their emotional honesty and through their mix of light and shade. Um, so I hope that for the next um, hour or so, uh, Terence and I will be able to talk about his experiences and approaches to filmmaking, but we're also really uh, interested to hear from those of you in the virtual space that we can't see. Um, but if you have questions that you'd like to put to Terence, um, if you could pop them in the Q&A box at the bottom of your Zoom screen, um, then I will keep an eye on those and uh, ask them as and when uh, we, we find a moment to do that. Um, but let's, uh, let's get started. And Terence, if you don't mind, I thought perhaps we could start with the present and then sort of delve a little into the past. Um, and I wondered uh, what, what you're working on at the moment. I uh, have a hunch that you are in post-production on Benediction. Is that a useful mm -hmm. post on the film? Yes, uh, well, we've got to deliver the film by uh, the end of March. Um, I'm not uh, completely on track with that. We've just got to sort out the last ADR and um, some special effects, which I, ha I had done. Um, but it, it's it's about Siegfried Sassoon, you know, one of the great, uh, three, one of the three great poets of the First World War. Um, and I, I had never really read him properly. Um, although, uh, ironically, when I got into drum school, one of the things you could, you, uh, you had to do with your audition, uh, uh, a piece of candidate seven choice. And mine was concert interpretation by Siegfried Sassoon. And it was about the first production in this country in 1913 at the Drury Lane of Stravinsky's The Rite of Spring. Oh, and wow. it is it is the most wonderfully comic, uh, fabulous English. Um, and he just describes the audience because in the previous year, um, it had been received with boos and cheers in Paris because the British don't do that. Um, and he just describes everybody in this theater. And the, the, the stanza I love most of all is, and in the gallery, cargo to capacity, no tremors, bowed eruptions and alarms. They are listening to this not quite new audacity as though it were by someone dead, like Brahms. <laughs> it's glorious, it's glorious. And that's how we, we, we begin the film. Um, but it, what I wanted to do with it um, was because it's about basically the First World War. We, even with huge amounts of money, you cannot recreate what it was like. When you see that footage, it is 
both appalling and exquisite. And I thought, we've just got to use that. We've got to use that. And we chart his, his history um, from the, just before the First World War. And what I found when I was searching for this, is it searching for his life, he seems to be constantly fi- trying to find redemption and never achieves it. And it, that's what's heartbreaking. I mean, he was gay, he had very bad lovers, and the only person he really fell in love with was Wilfred Owen, and that was a non-sexual relationship. You know, he marries, and he basically says to him, you know, you're going to save me. How can you possibly say that to someone else? He becomes a Catholic. God alone knows why. Um, I, being an ex-Catholic, I find it appalling. But he never found his redemption. And the awful thing about that is, um, I think part of me responds to that, because you could only find redemption within yourself. No one or no other thing can give it. Um, but my goodness, we had a a wonderful team, a wonderful cast of actors, wonderful production team, wonderful financiers who were so supportive. I cannot tell you. I've been blessed. Well, I was I was going to start by asking you sort of why so soon, but I think you you've you've answered that and more. Um, and uh, you know, now I think we just uh, you know wish you kind of all kind of speed and success in, in, in delivering the film and you've already painted such a kind of vivid portrait of it and um, of course you're someone uh, you know who grew up with an absolute love of cinema and you know that's in your own kind of history and it's also very much present in the films but when you were growing up and falling in love with cinema was it something that you ever sort of entertained as an area that you might go on and, and work in? No, um, the, I was from a large working class family. Working class people didn't go to university, for instance. I mean, I, I, I was, I'm not a great scholar, I, I was all right. Um, but we were basically told when we were 14, if you were reasonably intelligent, you went into an office. If you were not, but were adept at technical things, you had an apprenticeship. And those were the days when apprenticeships wasn't, were not considered second rate. They were considered just as important. Um, so I, I came from that, but what, what I got from this, I really, I thought that what I saw was literally true. Mm. And the sheer power of it, I didn't realize it at the time, but I mean, at that time, my sisters brought me up on American musicals. You know, I mean, how could you? I mean, I was seven when I saw Singing in the Rain. I mean, how can you not fall in love with movies? But at that time, British comedies were the only films that actually played as the main feature because you had the big picture and the support. British films always were support, except then, because we had wonderful, a wonderful fabulous array of people who were just, I mean, Terry Thomas could be in the last 10 minutes and the joy it gave. Um, Margaret Rutherford again, Alice, the wonderful Alice the Sim. So I grew up on that. Um, but I never ever thought, I mean, I remember seeing Seven Brides for Seven Brothers, for instance, which I saw in the school holidays, which I went to see again and again and again. And many years later, um, a lovely friend of mine who is now actually dead, um, Mary Lee Bandy, at the okay. The Institute of uh, Modern Art, it was Museum of Modern Art. So we're showing a new print of Seven Brides for Seven Brothers uh, because it's shot in ag for color, which had degenerated into a kind of blue. Mm. And I was sitting, and behind me was sitting Jane Powell and two of the girls who were in those in the chorus. And I thought, I cannot believe this. Had anyone said to me, you'll be, you'll be sitting in front of Jane Powell and Mary Lee Bandy said, I'll introduce you. I said, no, I, I, I don't want to. I, I, I know I won't have anything to say. And I can still see her now in this brilliant red dress. And she looked fabulous, but, but it became a kind of religion for me. And I watched everything. Mm. Literally, I'd watch anything, including that awful moribund part of British cinema, you know, with Edgar Lustgard, Scotland Yard. I mean, someone described him as 
the human equivalent of a blunt instrument. <laughs> they were utterly lifeless, utterly, utterly lifeless. But I, you just, when you love something, and there are certain films I know where I sat, the mm. route I took. Mm. So it became a kind of religion, quite, but I had no idea it was doing this to me. So your aspiration wasn't originally to be a director. It was to write or to act or what, what, where did you kind of start to make your way in? Well, I wanted to act and write originally. Um, and I joined an amateur theatre group, you know, in, in uh, Liverpool, um, which was, was lovely. It was just lovely. People got together because they wanted, especially in these chilling, freezing um, church halls, I can remember. Um, and I, I want, that's what I wanted to do. I wanted to write. I mean, the writing, of course, was dreadful, probably like my acting. Um, but, you know, you write, and you have to write yourself out of, you know, um, sub sub Jane Eyre or something like that, you know, I mean, because that was the first great novel I read, ever read, Jane Eyre, when I was 15. Um, but no, I wanted to act and write, but I, those days, I mean, you had to earn a living. And one of the things about a working class family is you had to contribute to the running of the house and you gave 30 bob and you had to, you just had to, you just had to. And so I went into a shipping office um, when I was 15 which was completely Dickensian. Um, uh, we shared it with uh, another uh, company called, what was it called? Sullivan's, I think. They made gunpowder, would you believe? They made gunpowder. And the man who ran it was called Mr. Todd, who was 80 odd. Um, and he would come in in complete Edwardian clothes, including spats. And, he would leave his, the, the engine of his car running. And one of my jobs was to go outside, hear if the engine was running, and then go in and say, Mr. Todd, you've left your engine running. And he would leave, and he wouldn't come back for days. <laughs> it was quite incredible. Um, but that's how I, but I did, I acted and wrote in the evening. And so it's, I'm sort of curtailing quite a long, uh, you know, sort of, um, period of time and process that brought you to a place where you were able to direct your first short sure, part of the trilogy, um, uh, that being children. Now, it's quite well documented that when you were um, making children, you did not, the experience of directing your first film was not a particularly happy one. Um, and that the process of directing wasn't a, you know, was also not, um, you know, not perhaps what you might have um, imagined it would be. I wondered um, sort of what you took from that, from having a kind of bad experience of, of, of filming your first film, because lots of people would just have sort of called it quits at that point. But I feel like there was a sort of determination in you somehow that, that kind of kept you going. But I didn't know that that was there. I mean, it was a horrible experience. Apart from um, Bill Diver, who shot it for me, he was my only support. I mean, uh, we'd set up shots and the, the whole of the crew would go like this. It was awful. One of them shouted at me for 10 minutes how awful he thought the script was and how awful he thought the title was. Um, it was the most, one of the most unpleasant experiences. And, and I, hadn't, I didn't know what I was doing. I mean, but I mustn't, must not forget to say that while I was at drama school, I, I wrote children and I had sent it to the BFI. And it was Mamoun Hassan who said, you know, come down and see me. I came down to see him. They were in Lower Marsh then. And he said, you have eight and a half thousand pounds, not a penny more, you will direct. I, I said, I've never directed. But he said, well, now's your chance. I owe that man so much. I owe that man so much. It was an awful experience. I just thought they made me feel that I was utterly talentless. Um, it was awful, the, the cutting, it was dreadful, it was dreadful. And by that time, um, Peter Sainsbury had taken over. And I said, look, it's a, it's a mess. You've wasted eight and a half thousand pounds, which in 1973-74 was a great deal of money. And he said, well, don't despair. Would you go back into the cutting room again? I said, okay, but you're throwing good money after bad. Said, if I find someone, 
will you do it? I said, okay. And there was a wonderful woman called Sarah, Sarah Ellis. And she was so lovely. And the, the, the cut was awful. Um, and I said, she said, well, what do you want to do first? And I said, well, could we look at the ending? Because I had seen it as the boy at the window would dissolve out, come back to him. I said, all right, I'll mark it up there. So, so I don't think it will work. Those days you had to send it off to the lab laboratory. They came back two days later and we ran through. She said, it works. Oh, I cannot tell you how great. She was wonderful, that woman. She really was so kind. Um, but that's, it was a baptism by fire. And, but, but those days, you know, thank God, uh, we got grants to go to drama school, as we should have now. People shouldn't have to pay for um, private um going to um, college or anywhere else. That should, the, the state should do that. And those days, I, I, was on a, I was on a grant from Liverpool. And if you didn't finish your course, you had to pay it back. So I went back to um, drama school for the second year and met with a great deal of jealousy, quite frankly. And my, my Second year was awful. Uh, I, I spent most of my time in the library crying, thinking, will this never end? Will this never end? And the, then the film came out, and I thought it was a mess. And it, it was taken in the, um, the diplomatic bag to America. Mm -hmm. And people wanted to see it. And I, I even won a prize at Chicago. I couldn't believe it. I could not believe it. And I met John Hasman, you know, oh, mm. utter bliss. But I, I never, never thought, I thought this is that I, I can't, if it's this difficult, then I'm obviously, I've got no talent at all. So that, so that the fact that the film was sort of well received and there was an appetite for the film, was that something that then sort of spurred you on in terms of giving you the, courage or the determination to continue in a way yes because what i didn't understand and this to me was a, a huge revelation what goes on beyond the frame mm. that you actually imagine that's what I, that's what i thought was so exciting and I, I, because one of my great loves is uh, four quartets mm -hmm. by Eliot, the nature of time and how we perceive time and i thought but there's something wonderful about that. And I knew in my heart, I, d I said, I, I didn't know how I would do it, but I thought I want to make films. Even if I make them badly, I want to do it. That, that was the revelation. But one of the things that I find uh, uh, kind of fascinating in going back and looking at the films again, which I know you never like to do, but I have been doing over the last few days in preparation for today, I think sometimes when we talk with filmmakers, we talk about a sort of developing style or voice or, you know, different ways in which we might talk about it. But I feel that with your work, when we look even at the early films, when we look at children or, you know, the other two films in the trilogy, you were, you say that you kind of weren't, you didn't really know what you were doing, but somehow kind of instinctively it seems that you did because actually the way in which you work with time and the fluid and sort of uh not in a negative way but quite sort of elusive qualities of time i feel like that's something that that is kind of really threaded through the work from very early on but i i was completely unaware of it all i knew and it's it's still true to this day if i feel in my stomach it's right Mm. then I know it is. Um, and that's the same with casting. You know, you just think, I don't need to see their work. You know, they're right. I, I've always had that. I didn't know, but at that time, I didn't know that I had an inner voice. And I've always tried to be honest to that inner voice, um, which sometimes is not easy. Um, but when you start to be transformed by something, you're not aware of it. Mm. But there's something... At, at the back of your voice inside saying, this is what's interesting. Mm. And you look through the camera and I still, still now look through that lens and think, oh, it's magic, it's magic. And I don't know why, I still don't know why. Mm. 
Um, but it has to be magic. Uh, what I want, what I love is when something is truly cinematic. Mm. You know, and sometimes you may only have a bit of a film. I mean, look at the opening of The Big Country. One of the great scores, fabulous opening that Saul Bass did. The rest of it, alas, you know, mm. is very difficult to watch. But what an opening. What an opening. But what you're describing, that that sheer kind of joy, if you like, of looking kind of, you know, through the eyepiece or, you know, sort of down the camera, there's a way in which that all of those years kind of sitting in the, you know, whatever cinema it was in Liverpool, it, it feels like it's kind of built layers and layers of understanding um, and appreciation alongside the sheer kind of, joy that so that when you came to make your own films that was in you that was part of you I didn't know that I, I didn't because you you don't know about how you're influenced I mean you just don't know um it's just that when you see things that you love I mean even if they're not that good mm. there's such a joy there you think in that moment it was perfect you know, I, mean, I love American musicals. I and mean, there's a minor one called Mother War Tides. Um, it was, it's Betty Grable and Dan Daly. And there's one wonderful sequence. And it's called Kokomo, Indiana. And they just dance to Kokomo, Indiana. And it's perfect. It's utterly perfect. Look, and it reminded me of that scene in Singing in the Rain. When he go, he takes Debbie Reynolds in and he creates mm -hmm. this, and you actually see him create this, and we know that it's all false, but suddenly we are in a garden, it is moonlight, and there's there is a slight wind. I mean, just so gorgeous. And um, that I think that is that sequence is one of the most avant-garde in cinema. It's extraordinary. I have to confess, I can hardly listen to to that part because I'm still laughing at the idea of a film called Mother War Tights. Can you imagine? Because you're not imagine, alone. <laughs> imagine trying to get a film called that off the ground now. I mean, it would in any case, be yes, a forget very, it. it would be a very austere kind of social realist <laughs> drama for a start with a lot of misery, but it's just such an amazing... But, but also, if we met it in England, there'd be a... a, a it in brackets, and father did too. <laughs> now, of course, I just want you to make that film. <laughs> um, I want to again. It's. I feel like my. You know, we 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 could we could simply talk about time passing, but actually, I feel like my job tonight is is to you know kind of be the timekeeper. So, so with that in mind, I wanted to talk a little bit about. Um, Madonna and Child, which is the film that you um, made as I think your graduation film when you were at the NFTS. Um, I watched I watched that again at the weekend too, and um, it's a long time since I've seen the film, and I don't know whether it says more about me or the time that we live in. But I was really struck by how incredibly bold the film is um, on a number of levels. I think there's a there's a boldness in some of the formal choices that you make um, and I know you know you've talked in in interviews about the sort of the long shot on the on the bus but what I really wanted to talk about was the film is also very bold in terms of its depiction of homosexual desire and sex and I wondered how at the time that went down at the school, was it something that was, I mean, did it, you know, did, was it a very kind of open process or were were there any sort of concerns about the content of the film? Um, from later on, I heard that there were concerns um, from the board. In fact, when we showed it, um, one of the board members who was sitting in front of me said very loudly, this should not have been made at all. Um, uh, and I didn't, I, I didn't feel that it was bold. I felt it was truthful. Um, and, and some of the scenes were extremely hard to shoot. Mm. And it, ironically, some of them, I was the only person who was embarrassed. You know, the actors were fine. You think, God almighty. But it, it came from 
Uh, despair, really. The, the, the trilogy comes from despair because I did despair. I, I mean, I, I was a very devout Catholic I, and I thought if I do the things that are, I've been taught, God will forgive me and God will make me whole. And I play, I literally prayed until my knees bled and no sucker came. It was one of the, the bleakest times of my life. So I tried to be true to that. But as always, um, while I was cutting it, um, Alexander McKendrick came to the school, was a wonderful teacher and a wonderful man. And I, 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 was, I, I had flu this particular week and I didn't go in. And Alexander McKendrick went to see it. And he came out and someone said to him, what have you been to see, Mr. McKendrick? He said, Madonna and Child. And they said, it's a gay movie, isn't it? He said, not at the moment. <laughs> isn't that, isn't that wonderful? <laughs> it was incredibly miserable. It was incredibly miserable. And there was one shot in it um, where the man who, my alter ego, was going um, back from the office. And in which he shot in the office that I, I worked in. And there was this one, it was light about 4.15, 4.30, this revolving bridge, and he walked across. It was just knockout. And Colin, uh, who was at the head of the school then, oh, young. said, you've got to drop that. It's, it's, it's superfluous. I was outraged. How dare you? I said. I'd stormed out. By the time I got home, I thought, he's right. So I rang mum and said, you're right. She said, come round for a drink. Um, but he was right. You, and it taught me one really important thing. If you're attached to something because it looks pretty, don't use it. And he's absolutely right. Um, but he was very supportive. Um, but uh, there was um, a fair amount of opposition to it because of its content. I mean, even the woman who's a lovely actress, Sheila Rayner, um, I saw her and she said, I've read the scripture. I think it's really sordid. And she said, but I'd like to do it, mm. which was really wonderful. And we shot in my house, at my flat, you know, with my mom. I mean, we did. Um, I, need, I needed to get it sort of out of my system. Um, not that you ever do get it out, because, I mean, the, the, the problem is I never, ever accepted being gay. I, I want to be ordinary. I just want to be ordinary like everybody else. Um, and it's 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 been a, a cross that I feel that I've had to bear. I don't like the gay scene. I, yeah. I just can't bear it. I can't live like that. I'm, I'm not condemning other people who do. If they find it, that's fine. It just wasn't right for me. But it can make for a lonely life. Mm. But I, mean, I thought far better to be lonely than do something that I found mm, my conscience wouldn't allow me to. Um, and a lot has changed, you know, and it's good that it's changed, that you can see things on television that are about gay people who are happy being gay. That's an enormous, an enormous progression. You know, I, I grew up when it was still a criminal offence, and thank God that's not there anymore. So it, it's right for that, but it just wasn't for me. But I will all, I'll always have that guilt inside me. I will all have that thinking, oh, I long to be just like everybody else. I do. And I think that, I think for anyone who might not, you know, might not quite understand that, I think watching the trilogy is a really good way of, you know, kind of stepping, I mean, not absolutely into your shoes, but, um, you know, to, to give an understanding of the sort of the longing. And also, as you said, the sort of loneliness that can come from that feeling of, you know, not being really, um, you know, part of something or somehow not, you know, it's, it's, I always feel it's a little bit simplistic to, to, to just talk about, you know, the, the idea of the outsider. But I think in a lot of your films, I think even in something very recent, like A Quiet Passion, there is a way in which I think you understand that sense of being a little apart or looking mm. up rather than being fully inside something. My heart goes out to those people. And I, I think it's appalling that, you know, Emily Dickinson wasn't well known in her lifetime. I and mean, she's the great poet of, of 19th century America, I think greater than Walt Whitman. Um, Bruckner is the same, you know, he was in his 60s before he had his first success. You know, my, I, 
my heart goes out to them and I feel for them. Uh, and I think it's my manager who said, and I think it's true, um, that A Quiet Passion is my most personal film. And I think it's true. I really, really did feel for her because I think she's a great poet. Um, so I am drawn to that. I, I, I'm not, it's not that I seek out those things. I just feel an, an instant love for them, you know? Um, and, and in a way, Siegfried Sassoon is the same, you know? I mean, he, he, he did know great success and he was, you know, financially successful on this, but his spiritual life was actually bereft, you know? And how do you carry on? How do you carry on with that? Um, and you know, you marry someone um, because you you think that they will be part of this redemption. You know, and what's sad is that you know Hester thought she was going to give that. You know, she actually because she actually said in real life to him, you know, oh, uh, Stephen has told me and all that I need to know, which is incredibly naive but incredibly kind. But unfortunately, that's not real life. You know, and he ended up by treating her dreadfully. And he did treat her very, very badly. I mean, you watch, you look at photographs of when he first met her and she's gorgeous, lying on this chaise long in this oyster gray silk. She looks gorgeous. You look at her in her fifties and she looks completely defeated. When you're, when you're sort of approaching, um, you know, a subject for a film like Emily Dickinson or, Siegfried Sassoon and you have that sort of emotional connection how do you marry that with what I imagine must be a fairly extensive and quite meticulous period of research are you someone who enjoys that part of the process how, how do you come to the the sort of research part of well, but the, the research was really daunting, um, which is why the film took nearly five years to get to the screen. I mean, I read three massive biographies, and he, he talk about a social animal. He was out all the time. You kept on thinking, look, can you stay in for a fortnight? No, give us a break, for God's sake. Um, but in, in that life, I mean, obviously, it's my subjective view of that life. And I responded to things that I felt were true, that had an echo in me, the nature of poetry, the nature of time, the nature of being outside. And the fact that even though he was in a, a social echelon that could actually practice openly gay sex, they were protected. And that was true even into the 50s. But it's greater than that. It's how do you, how do you live knowing that within you there's a hole, and I know what that hole is. For me, it's I just wanted to be hmm. ordinary and, and wanted to continue to believe in Catholicism. And I know that how that feels. Um, and those are the things that I responded to, which I saw in him. Had it been somebody else, they would have responded, say, to the fact he was a great hunter. Well, I don't want to write about hunting because I don't think it's a sport, you know. Um, and some of the early poetry, like the, the daffodil murders, like, you know, it's, hard, it's as hard going as Maud, you know. Um, but once he gets into the First World War, yeah. that's what transforms him into a great poet. And the fact that he was incredibly brave and he saw it as cowardice. And that's that's quite wonderful. And to, to actually have in Craig Lockhart, your psychotherapist, Mr. Rivers, who is also gay. I mean, and he that man was the first psychiatrist to bring in the talking method and he really was a, an enormous help to S S Sassoon so Sassoon was surrounded by some people who really loved him Wilfred Owen did Robbie Ross did I mean these people really loved him um but it, it was never I don't think he was ever fulfilled and I think actually that's exactly the way I feel mm. and that I, I, I that sense of a um a yearning almost or a longing I feel is again something that that sort of recurs in your films uh, and there is certainly that sense of it being um an experience that is that is close to you and that you know well yes and also you know one also feels it in music particularly for me Bruckner um there are moments in the seventh symphony that just pierce your heart. They're so beautiful. 
and they're so moving. And you can feel this deep, deep yearning, what the Germans call Sehnsucht. Mm. It's a deep yearning. How can you not respond to that? How can you not respond to it? You don't have to be a musician to respond to it. You just think he knows about it. But with Bruckner, I mean, he was a, a confirmed Catholic. And there's only one moment in, this, in the last movement of the Ninth Symphony where there's a huge dissonance, which is very unusual, Bruckner. And for it, you feel for a moment, he's thought, is it all a lie? And then, the symphony ends with a resignation to life, and he believes. But that moment is extraordinary. Mm. Well, and it's very kind of perceptive to, to notice that. I wanted to ask about, about uh, you're, you're someone who is a writer-director. I wanted to ask about the process of writing, partly because we were talking a few moments ago about sort of writing and acting being initially the sort of the, 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 the route in. I wonder if you're someone who enjoys the writing part of the process. And I also am curious about how you write. Are, like, are you a sort of, I get up at this time, I sit down and I write this many hours or how, how does it go? No. Well, A, I write in longhand, you know, and I mean, talk about who needs help? I've got to underline it in red. I mean, for God's sake, at 75, I'm still doing it. Um, but but the, you worry about a problem and think, look, I, I, I just can't. I just can't work it out. And then something will happen. You think, yes, I know what to do now. Um, and once I write it down, it's fixed. You know, it, it can change, but I know that that's basically the right idea. So that by the time I only ever do three drafts with a polish, um, and that's what we shoot. And I know every single shot in the film, simply because when you're on, working on small budgets, you have got to know that. You go into the location, you say, yes, the, the setups are here. Which way do you want to shoot for the for the lighting cameraman? Um, I've always done that uh, uh, because it was it was Bergman who said, you know, if you can only improvise if you prepare, and I can, I can think on my feet. If something doesn't ha work, you think, what have I got to do? And only once in my entire career did I not know what the frame was. It was on um, Deep Blue Sea. And I sat there with the two um, producers and this wonderful supervisor, um, Susanna Lenton, who is just wonderful. Dead silence. I said, well, I don't, I don't know what the frame is. And she gave me the greatest piece of advice I've ever been given. She said, is the action true? Said, yes, you're right. We'll change the action you want. She was absolutely right. It's the most wonderful piece of advice I've ever been given. Mm. So, the, so the problem was, was not with the frame, actually. It was with the action. So you solved yes. the problem by changing something, something else. Yes. But that was a wonderful, that was a wonderful piece of advice. It's just like sometimes, you know, you think, no, we don't really need that. We don't really need that truth. So just keep, just keep on the person in the frame. And you let it run slightly longer sometimes to the point where it becomes almost uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's when you stop. But also the really important thing is you've got to know when not to direct. Mm -hmm. They come on sometimes and you think, I don't need to do anything today. And they're really on the ball. Sometimes I say, would you like to go straight away? And they have to say, yeah. Mm. But you can only do that. You've got to feel that, not even scene by scene, but shot by shot. Because sometimes you think, I know they're going to have difficulty with this. You know, for whatever reason, you just can tell. Um, and other times you thought, oh, I'm worried about this shot. And they come in and say, well, fine, yes, we'll do it. You see, you know, like there's the, a the, the, the scene in the um, in um, Sunset Song where they have, well, she's basically raped in her ma marriage. And, and I said, look, you know, I'm really worried about it because it's very unpleasant. And we are only going to do one take. We are not going to do it again. Mm -hmm. So if it's terrible, then that's it. We live with terrible. And it was terrifying. I mean, they were fabulous, those two actors. You know, and I, I was the one that was terrified of that because it's very unpleasant. It's very unpleasant. And they were fabulous. 
they were fabulous, but I did say one sh one take, that's it, we stop. And sometimes you have to say, no, can we, uh, on something that's not as violent as that, but no, can we just do one more? Mm. Just one more. And sometimes, you know, you think, and they get cross with you. So, but just, please, just one more. Um, but I think, again, it's a, it's a characteristic of your work that there are things in the work that are unpleasant and hard to look at because they have to be. Yes. So, so uh, well, there's, there's a line in um, a, 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 in, in Sassoon, you know, which says, "Very often the truth is unpleasant. It's not pleasant to look at, and that's very hard, especially if you're looking at yourself, um, which he did all the time, you know, um, and had a a kind of deep conscience about things. You know, he he would not have behaved like Ivan Novello did. Ivan Novello was quite frankly, sexually venal, and, and Sassoon wasn't, you know, and what's lovely about his relationship with Wilfred Owen is that it is utterly pure, mm. and they never, ever, ever say it. Mm. And the, uh, Jack Loudon is wonderful in this. He's, he's, uh, he's wonderful throughout, but this lad who plays Wilfred Owen, oh, as soon as you sit, you're one of those people you just want to put your arms around, they are you all right? You know, just loved it. I was very blessed, I'm blessed. Mm. But that idea of not saying too, I mean, you know, I just made the point that you, you sometimes show us things that are uncomfortable to see, but you're also very good at not showing us things and allowing us to kind of, to imagine or take a line of, thought or association and and we are kind of filling the space that you leave for us but, but it's very interesting um uh, uh, when we were showing sunset song uh, in the q and a they said he said if you had gone on for a second more when he's the lad is being beaten in the bomb i would have had to walk out i said but you didn't see anything she said, yes. I said, no, actually, you didn't. The way they're framed is, you don't see the, backs, the back of the slide at all. Mm. You don't see it. Mm. You only see it when he goes up to his bedroom with his sister and she strokes his back. You, you supplied the difference. Mm. And that's always much more powerful. You know, it's much more powerful than making it explicit. Mm. And, and it's not just in case in terms of vans, but sometimes in terms of just texture. Just saying, just don't do it, just look. Mm. Uh, and, and sometimes, uh, and this I, I do find thrilling, um, when actors know how to listen. Because it's very difficult to actually listen. You know, it really is. Um, one of the, 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 the template I would use is James Mason in A Star Is Born, when she has that long song about being, um, she tells him what the song was, and they've been shooting it. And every single reaction shot, you look, he looks as though he's just heard it for the first time, and he's really enjoying it. And it's really hard to do. Mm. It's really hard to do. Um, and when this lad um, did Wilfred Owen, I said, you know, just, he's reading, oh, just look at it. And you're, because he's supplying, he's supplying the subtext. Because when you look or don't look, it, especially when you're doing it in close-up, it has a very powerful effect. And you just say, just do, just look. Mm. And I love that. I love that. Because then people do things that they're not aware of. And, and it was Bresson, I think, who said, what people do is interesting, but what they don't do is really interesting. Yeah. Yes. I wondered, you've worked with a lot of actors over the years, great actors, and you've also been very assiduous in choosing the right people for the part rather than, you know, a, a particular sort of name or someone who may have been in vogue in a particular moment. But I also wondered about your own experience as someone who, who you know you have acted so you have I assume also uh, been directed whether on stage or um, and I wondered whether that even from very early on working with actors what did that sort of mean in terms of how you engage with actors and how you work with them 
Well, it's on sort of technical basis, you know, I mean, I know how you have to um, build up a, a character. And there are two forms, really, of acting. One where you find the character and then you accrete all sorts of things to it. One where you find the character and you delete everything. The problem with both is, the first one is that you can start putting in things that are mere mannerism and don't mean anything. And the second one is if you haven't found the character anyway, there's nothing to pare down from. So you're, it's a boring it's a boring performance. Um, but so technical things like that, I'm, I'm, for instance, if I can say a long line on a single breath, then I don't see why someone who's a professional actor can't do the same. Because what's crept in um, to acting here is what, is what it is in America. You split a sentence in between. And I said, please don't do that. I really don't like it. If I'd wanted that, I'd have put punctuation in. Uh, I, if I put a hyphen in, then you pause. And it, so the, technically, if I know if I can say it on a single breath, then there's no reason why someone else can't. But you, you also have to be aware of how they feel. Um, and this is felt on a shot by shot basis. For instance, I, I said to someone many years ago, oh, who said the oh, the actors is being a bit, a bit precious. I said, well, no, because they get up very early, they get made up, and they get into a car. And supposing the driver is rude to them, that can hurt you for the rest of the day. I know because that's happened to me. Or he says something nice and the rest of the day is irradiated. They're the emotions are very near the surface, and you have to be very careful and very kind about that. But you have to be rigorous as well. When it starts to become mannered, you say stop. No, it's 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 not. It's now not felt. I tried to get everything in under seven takes, including the big shots. Uh, that will always be more than that. But I mean, the average the average take amount of takes on um, so soon it was four takes. Mm. Because after seven, they start to become repetitive. You can't fail but to be repetitive. And it's in those early takes that they do things that you just think, oh, isn't that wonderful? And even this is even true of extras. I mean, there, there was one man in um, A Quiet Passion, in, in the, he was, um, the, she's, it's a singer singing bel canto. And the, the camera came up like this to the four main people. And he was just in this box here. And he had a passed neck. And he just went like this. I thought, I'm not going to tell him to do it again. Please let him do it again. And he did. And you want to shout with joy. Because yeah. that, that's, that's icing on the cake. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's like a small present. <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> um, I wondered if we could talk a little bit about the, the sort of visual um, style of the films and you're someone whose work is very often described as painterly, but when you are um, writing and thinking about a film, are you, um, how do you communicate with the other people who, uh, you know, you will be working with about the kind of visual style that you are intending? Do you use paintings or use other visual materials? How do you how do you kind of work on that side of the film? Well, well the template is always Vermeer. Um, always. I, I love Vermeer. But with um, Sunset Song, for instance, um, Andy Harris, who um, did the production design, said, have you seen some, someone called, um, um, oh, what's his name? It's a Danish painter. Hammershaw. Yes, yes. And I said, no. And I, he, I sort of, I said, it's got to look like that. I mean, in, in terms of um, House of Mirth, it was basically um, like those portraits of, um, who did, Whistler, Whistler did, of, of these very famous, very rich Americans that are terrifying. <laughs> They're really terrifying. It's got to look like that, or it's got to look like Sickert. Um, but it, it's, one once you've sorted out what it should look like, then, other people bring to it things that I wouldn't have done, you know. I mean, uh, so it's not saying, oh, it's got to look like this or like that, but have this, have this feel. Um, it, it's what's what's more important than even even actually how it's shot is is texture, because if you if you have texture within the mise en scène, you respond to it 
but you respond to it subliminally. You, 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 you're not aware of it, you, but something in you feels it. Um, lovely things. I mean, and they may not be seen by the audience, but the fact that in the in, in the last film, um, in one of the um, flats, the woman who had done all the dressing was a genius. Put a tortoiseshell cigarette case. Mm. I mean, we may not see it. I think we don't see it. But the fact that she thought about it, I, I find that I, you, at some point you have to say, now you've got to interpret what I feel. And the heads of department, all of them, they've got to be treated as artists because they're artists in their own right. And you have to give them that freedom and that respect. And they do wonderful things for you. Wonderful things, you know. Um, so it, it it really is collaborative of saying this is this is the the, uh, the visual idea, and then they interpret it. And when they reinterpret it, it it, it makes it better because they've used their time. Like the clothes, for instance. I always said I I want them to look as though they wear these clothes, not because there's nothing worse than in period people coming on the screen and they look as they've got from hair, makeup, and costume, and you just think I don't believe it. And you know, I've had wonderful people who've got the most exquisite things. You know, I mean, there's a one wonderful dress in um, amongst many. In um, the, the Sassoon, his mother, played by Geraldine James, is kind of a very, very pale mauve lilac. Mm. And you think, and she looks as though she's worn it repeatedly. And that's true. Uh, so that it must have that kind of truth, I think. And if it's got that truth, if not only what you see, but what you feel, simply just texture, then that makes the frame alive. It just does. So the people moving in front of it have this wonderful kind of visual subtext that you don't have to say anything about because it's just there. Also, so the way that the light may fall. I mean, in um, A Quiet Passion, in the, in the seminary, I mean, th there's a lovely shot of her standing by the window with this wonderful light coming in, and that was real light. I said, Qu quick, please, can we do it straight away, quick? That was real light. We didn't put any any more lights in it. it so it's at the, oh, you've got to feel it at the time as well. So that's that's really kind of prompting me to think about um, Something in the films that I think is very clear is you make films that are often set in the past, but they feel very relevant and modern, not in an anachronistic way, but they feel they have a kind of freshness. It's, it's like the past is not confined to a certain historical moment. So I'm wondering if that's, I, I, you know, I, I kind of guess what you're saying about the that search for things needing to feel true. There's something about the the truth of the past that you're creating on screen that is not about kind of chasing an absolute, you know, sort of point by point historical veracity, if you like. It's a cinematic. It's a truthful cinematic past. Because, yes, because the past is always with us. It, it is. You can't get away from it. It is always present, as, as Elliot said. But the, the practical thing about doing it, um, everything in period is because I don't understand the modern world. I mean, I'm completely, I'm a complete technophobe. And not only am I completely bewildered by the, the modern world, I have to be honest, I'm rather repelled by it. Um, I'm repelled by the narcissism of it. Um, and everybody is the center of the universe. Well, we're not, we're not. I mean, why on earth do you want to take a photograph of a meal you're going to have? I mean, what on earth is the, what's the point of going on Twitter? It just, it's just, something that I find completely alien and I don't understand the world. That's why I can't interpret the modern world. I just can't understand it. And as I say, there is that element of, for me, repellence. Mm. Uh, and, and perhaps I, I, I'm emotionally anchored in the past. I think probably I am. Probably the 1530s. But, that, but the point you're making, that the past is always with us, I mean, uh, absolutely, isn't it? It I is, isn't it? That's, we, we are never, 
you know, for better or worse, we are we we are never free of our past. No. And that's why it still lives. Because when we have our own memories, admittedly, we have our own backstory. So we, we can jump around from seven to 25, back to eight and up to 46. But we do that all the time. And the, 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 the problem with films that are supposed to be about memory usually are linear. And the past isn't linear. Memory is cyclical. You know, and it, it's prompted by emotion rather than what literally happened. And, and, and I've always felt that very, very strongly. What's, what's really interesting uh, about films is that going from one emotional state to another, that's what I find incredibly powerful. And that, that's what I love. And of course, that, that's, that's what your films are really built around. I, I wondered then to, to sort of think about that in relation to of time and the city, where it seems to me you're you're making a sort of documentary, but really it's a it's a it's a different mapping of a set of emotional connections. It just happens to look a bit more like a documentary mm. than well, it, films. Well, as I, I, I've been, as the poster said, you know, it's, it's a love song under eulogy. For that city doesn't exist anymore. The, the, the city that I grew up in is gone. It's been pulled down. Um, and all these lovely little lanes that I used to go up when I was still very, a uh, very, uh, I, I was just a clerk in a shipping office, like Tempest Hay and Leather Lane. They were Dickensian and lovely. They've all gone. Um, and it's changed and I don't feel, I feel like an alien there now. Um, so it was more, I think, a regret of what's gone. Um, and you can't keep things in aspect. You know, you can't, they change, they've got to. You know, but I'm terrified of change. I always see it as bad because um, I always see the loss and not the gain. Um, and I long for that time when I really, there was a time from when my father died just before I was seven till 11, I, I was still at primary school, when I really was ecstatically happy. You know, it was just, and then that happiness was destroyed when I went to secondary school because I was just beaten up every day for four years. But those four years, I was literally sick with happiness. Mm. I, I loved my street. I, I, you know, I loved going to church. You know, I loved going to school. Um, it was just so wonderful. And then it, it, it disintegrated as, as of course it always does um so I, I i think the longing that longing for those four years filled that that film I, I i think it's about the nature of loss um and the nature of age mm. and how do you age with dignity now i don't know mm. It's interesting to hear you talk about it in, in that way, because I guess that's, that makes me think about some of the other films, and particularly the sort of Liverpool films, if I can call them that. But if I think about Distant Voices, Still Lives and The Long Day Closes, where there is, there is kind of harshness and there's beauty and there's loss, but there's also pleasure and community. And, and I hadn't really thought before about the warmth that is in those films, which perhaps it's not that um, a time in the city uh, it doesn't have warmth, but it, but I, but I understand now what you're saying about the, um, about the sense of it as a sort of eulogy and the sense of loss that is perhaps less um, counterpointed than it might be in some of the other films where there mm. is community and uh, kind of a shared uh, joy or coming together. Because the worst thing about it is, even even in those four years, I knew even at the height of ecstasy that it was going to go. Mm. I, I, I I couldn't explain it because I was only you know between seven and eleven, but I remember feeling it very deeply. This this will go. This will pass. Um, and I found that very very hard, very hard indeed. But equally, you know, th there was some joy. I mean. Uh, say on a Sunday, we'd go to mass and, uh, and have communion, come back and eat, eat breakfast. Um, and then at 12 o'clock on the light programme, it was family favourites. Mm. And I remember coming out into the street one day and everyone was listening to family favourites, all the windows were open. 
um, and it was see the pyramids along the Nile. And it seemed so wonderful and exotic. Mm. Um, I wanted, I just have a couple of things that I'd like to ask you, and then um, I can see there are some questions coming in from other people in the room. So I'd like to bring those in too. Um, that thinking about a time in the city, there was a period leading up, leading up to that where it seemed to be very hard for you to make a film. You know, there was quite a long mm. hiatus. Um, I can, I mean, my assumption is that that was to do with a lack of, Funding is that is that is that well not just not just like a funding but nobody was interested yeah no, nobody was interested I kept on writing um but nobody was interested um and it was very hard and I thought well if if my career is over then House of Math is not a bad film to end on um, but I didn't know how I would earn a living because I couldn't have gone back to bookkeeping that really would have been an utter defeat um I have no idea. I had absolutely no idea. No one was interested. No one. Um, and thank God, um, Saul Papadopoulos and Roy Bolter at Hurricane Films got in touch with me. Because mm. if I, I owe them for resurrecting my career, because I really think it was... A, in fact, several people said to me afterwards, we thought you were dead. I think that's... I mean, I just find that scandalous and and shameful. You know, I think it, it's, it's shameful um, that the... That the British film community let that happen. But, but the, the the problem the problem I think with um, film in this country we're always looking over our shoulder to see what they like it in America. Well, that shouldn't be. If if you want to make films like that, there's nothing wrong with that. But there has to be other films that um, don't care whether they play well in um, Kalamazoo. You know, there's, otherwise we won't have a, a cinema of our own. You know, the stories that arise from these islands that only we can tell. Mm. Only we can tell. The French have it. On the continent, they have it. And I don't know whether it's by Roma or not, but have you seen a film called Private Conversations in Public Places? Oh, I know the title, but I honestly can't remember if I've seen it. But do you know what's wonderful in it? Is th the there's a light motif of snow. Mm. And in one scene, it snows inside. You try writing that and getting it funded. Mm. No one would touch it. No, they wouldn't. But it works. And I've no idea why. But you think, yes, of course it should snow inside. So it works because, again, there's, there is a cinematic truth in what's being presented. So we, so we don't yes. have to question it because it yes. works. And it's not literal. Yeah. Once you start to explain something, you kill it. Cinema's great at revealing, not just telling. That's why you can always tell when a, 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 a film has been made of a, a, a play. A few outdoor shots, and then they talk all the time. Well, you know, what's interesting about that? You know, nothing. You have to completely reimagine that experience. Otherwise, it just becomes film theatre. You know, sometimes it works beautifully. I mean, yes, I love the importance of being earnest for all those wonderful, wonderful performances and gorgeous Technicolor. I mean, who could not fall in love with Joan Greenwood? Mm. I have to say, I'm glad to say, I have never seen a spirit. Fabulous. But presumably that was exactly the, um, I don't want to say problem, but that was exactly what you faced when you came to make The Deep Blue Sea, um, particularly with a writer who's, uh, I mean, it's a personal opinion, but, you know, perhaps the dialogue is not really so, you know, it wouldn't kind of work so well in terms of... Also, I mean, that first act isn't true. My sisters when they got married, moved into houses like that. And they were grim. And those landladies were not concerned about your past. They were concerned about whether you could pay your rent or not. And if you couldn't, you were out. She would never, Hester would never have told her all this information. Mm. I, th I, said, I said, it's just absurd. You know, so in fact, the first act was reduced to seven minutes, you know, because it's, I don't believe that he's a great playwright. Because if you see something like, um, the Browning version, mm. 
he, he and John Dayton had to write a lot more, and the film's better than the play. Yes. The se and, and separate tables is as well. They're better than the plays. Um, they're, he's not, he's not the British Chekhov. No. He just isn't. No. No. So it, it, what you had to say, what, what, what is she going to, she's, for the first time in her married life, she's actually had an orgasm. Mm -hmm. And it changes her life. Suddenly there's this person she adores. Mm -hmm. how, how can it not transform you when you finally realize this is someone you adore, you want to be with them forever? That's, I mean, someone said, one of the critics who didn't like the film, said th this film is not in the least erotic. And it wasn't meant to be. It wasn't meant to be. What it's meant to be is the result of eroticism, not eroticism itself. Mm. Yes, that would have been, I mean, I was going to say that would have been a very different film. I can't imagine, <laughs> that, I mean, you couldn't really get that from that material. No, uh, you can't. Terence, there are a couple of questions in the um, Q and A, so I'm going to have a look at them. If, okay. if uh, and uh, I'm going to read them out. So the first one is from uh, Barnaby Brown, and it says, "Clearly, distant voices and your trilogy of uh, life show more complex narrative structures in their exploration of memory and time." I was I was wondering if you could talk about how this factors into the writing process. Do you write your films chronologically and then move sequences around, or do you write it as it will later appear on screen? Yes, I, I write it as I see it, um, uh, going from one emotional state to another, and that and that dictates what you need to do. Um, what changes is once you've shot it, um, I'd never look at the script again because that 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 footage has got to find its own meaning. You've got to find the subtext within that. Um, so I write it as explicitly as, as possible, including all the music cues, because they've, they've got to be cleared before you start shooting. You know, you've got to, especially when uh, things are timed to music. Um, so it, it's written in the way that I hear and see it. Um, I follow that. And, and if that works, then it, it is, Emotionally chronological, if you see what I mean. Mm, yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Um, a question here from uh, Chris Cassingham that says, uh, thank you very much for being with us this evening. And you said you spoke earlier about not being able to understand the present and your um, sort of uh, relationship with the past. He says, I think your work clearly shows a complicated relationship to both the past in general and your own personal past. Can you characterize your relationship to the past? Do you feel nostalgic for certain parts in your life? And if not, how do you reconcile those complicated feelings in visual terms? Well, the first part of the question, I try to avoid nostalgia because it always implies sentimentality. Um, and I don't like I don't like sentimentality because it's very easy. It's very easy to do that. It's much more difficult to actually move an audience, but that has to be a, a kind of different truth. Um, I, I think I'm in, I really do think I'm embedded in the past. Um, sometimes I think too much um, because it's, it also gives me great comfort, you know, to, to remember things um, that had happened, very small things, but, the comfort that comes with, because it's not just remembering what happened. I feel that I'm there. I can still, I'm very good at atmosphere. I, I, I'm particularly good at atmosphere, simply because, you know, before my father, before seven, my father was dying from cancer, um, two hours in, he was in the front rooms on the front pole and very, very violent. Um, and so the atmospheres were dreadful. I mean, these atmospheres would go on for hours, not five or 10 minutes, but hours. It's one of the things I can't actually bear now. Um, if anybody gives me the cold shoulder, I, I just can't bear. I said, look, I'd ruin you tell me off to do that. I can't bear it. I can't bear it. Um, and so I'm very conscious of atmosphere um, and I'm very conscious of recreating that um, and being true to that. I mean, like, for instance, I, before we started this, I happen to be thinking about um, Call Me Madam. Um, it's a lovely day today, sung beautifully by um, Donald O'Connor. 
I can remember where I stood in the cheap seats. I remember when I got in, I was on my own and this man started putting his leg towards me and I ended up by like this watching uh, call me madam. I love I love the film. Nothing happened, but I'd still love the film anyway. And so it's trying to recreate that. I mean, but in, in a way, it's it's difficult for me to analyze what I do or, mm. or the visual style because it just comes naturally to me. So it's very, very hard for me to stand back and say, Oh, I do this or I did it like that. I, I try to listen to my inner voice. And if my inner voice says, sorry. That's not right. I think, fine, I'll wait until it is right. And that's true of the cut as well. Sometimes, you know, you think, I don't like this. I, I don't like this. And then someone suggests something. And you do it. And it falls into place. And you think, yes, why didn't I think of that? Um, but you have to be constantly alive to the material whilst you're writing it, whilst you're casting it, whilst you're cutting it. But I, I'm unable to stand back and watch my style or stand back and look at the way I write because when I watch other people's films, I always think they're better than mine. <laughs> I, I think that's a whole separate conversation, Terry. Yes, yes for my analyst, for my <laughs> analyst. <laughs> Yes, but actually what you're describing, that, that feels like there's a real congruence between what you're describing about your own relationship with how you work, i.e. it's not, a, you don't stand back and dispassionately analyse what you're doing. You work in a more, a much more uh, sort of um, instinctive or, you know, kind of emotionally driven way. And that comes through into the work you know these are not films made by somebody of course there's rigor and preparation that allows you to work in a certain way but the films themselves have that tone and atmosphere of uh, you know sort of trust in a way between you and the material i feel that i've sort of i lack a layer somehow to deal with the world and to deal with the things that were in, in a more mature way. I think I really do lack something. I don't know what it is. Um, but the, the downside of that is, you know, your your day can be ruined by someone just being unpleasant, as well, I said before. And on a personal level, of course, that's a, you know, that's a hard condition to, um, it's a hard place to inhabit. But creatively, of course, I, you know, I think that sense of having, you know, not having a kind of thick skin or having a kind of layer missing, which gives you a sensitivity and attunement is perhaps what makes the work so rich. So for you personally, it's, it has those, you know, it makes it easy for you to feel the wounds, but actually the work is extraordinary. And, you know, whilst I, I, this is not the first time that I've heard you talk about, you know, wanting to be like everyone else. Of course, from an audience point of view, we are immensely grateful that you are not like everybody else, <laughs> that you make the work that only you could make. That's but but, but sometimes you, 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 you do. It's an awful thing to say, but sometimes you think, well, why am I doing it? Yeah. When you're at your lowest, you think, well, why am I doing it? You know, does anyone care? You know, how many people have not read four quartets and their lives are perfectly happy? You know, how many people have not listened to Bruckner and their lives are perfectly happy? Um, but I, I suppose you're sort of stuck with what you are. Um, and I wished I'd come to some kind of maturity where I could say, okay, well, you know, you, you are this mixed up wreck, you know, enjoy it. But I, because I can't, being, it's Catholic, you see. Mm. It's pleasurable, so it's, you mustn't do it. Exactly. Um, listen, I'm going to just check a couple more questions because, um, uh, okay, I'm going to read a, a question now from Daniel Turner. Daniel says, thank you for speaking to us. You spoke earlier about the films you loved growing up and how you fell in love with cinema. I'm interested to know if there were any filmmakers or films you felt affinity with or which inspired you as you were beginning to make films or once you became a, became a filmmaker. So I guess particular 
filmmakers. <laughs> I'm afraid all the people who've influenced me, they're all dead, <laughs> which is awful, but it's the truth. And there, there are one or two films by people who are living that I, I think are one. I think Aretha is one of the great cinema geniuses. Uh, um, I just think he's a genius. Um, so you see things like that, but the, the, the problem with watching other other films is because you know how they're made, you know, you're aware of cutting, you're aware of music, you're aware of acting, you're aware of that in a way that ordinary people are not aware of that. You know, I have some lovely musician um, neighbors uh, and you know, you say, "Oh, that, wasn't that a wonderful film?" They say, "Well, actually, no, it wasn't very good." You know, because they they play music all the time, so their their acuteness, they're acutely aware of what what I say a phrase is, or what a symphony is, all that thing. And when you are, when you do make them, in a way, it kind of destroys mm. your joy of it. You know, and that that's what I can't look with fresh eyes now um, on on certain new films. It's lovely when you see something that you like, but it's actually quite rare. I'm a very bad audience. I'm a very bad audience. But what I, and this is, comes back to um, what I said before about the past, there's there are certain films in the past that I adore that I could watch again and again and again, and I lose myself in them. Even if they're not that good, I, mm. I lose myself because I can remember when I saw them. It's very difficult now to be, A, a gentle audience. I, I'm very hard to please. Yeah. Um, and so when people do say, would you see my film? I say, look, you know, I've done this in the past and you, well, they've asked for my opinion and I've given it. And then I've got them saying, you know, you've been brutal. And, and I'd say, well, you did ask my opinion and that is my opinion. So I don't do that anymore. Mm. Mm. No, I understand that. And um, so there are a couple more questions. One is a question um, also from Barnaby Brown, where uh, and Barnaby says, being a filmmaker who attended film school, what advice would you give to current students regarding how to make the most of the experience? Well, first of all, you should enjoy it because you know it's, it's a wonderful, it's a wonderful experience and a wonderful experience. There, the fact that you can stop a film in the middle and dis dis dissect a, a, a scene—that's fabulous. Enjoy it, but. What you've got to understand, two things. One, you've got to be true to yourself. If you if you don't guard your integrity, no one else will. But there are practical things when you're making film, like money. It's other people's money, and you have a moral. You have a mor You're morally bound to do that, that and not be profligate. And there will be certain things which just says, you know, you can't have that because we can't afford it, and you've got to come up with an alternative. Um, it, it's it, it's a very expensive medium. The only other medium that's more expensive is opera. Um, and so you've got to husband your resources, um, but enjoy that three or two years, whatever it is. I, I, I had a lovely time there. I really did. I had a lovely, my year was lovely. But you've got to be very rigorous about the way you write, the way you shoot, the way you cut, and you've got to do it within the budget that you are given. You can't just prof be profligate. If you become terribly successful and, you know, you go to America and your next film is $200 million, what well, you can do is you like, um, but for, for the mass, vast majority of us, we're making s small films on small budgets. And you've, you've got to understand the practicalities of that without ever forgetting that this is supposed to be entertainment. You're supposed to be enjoying this. And if you enjoy it, even if it's a bad film, there will be an audience that will. I mean, we had a scene in Sassoon where I had to dance the Charles, and it was joyous. They enjoyed it. We all enjoyed it. So there's got to be a moment when you say, yes, we really had a good time. Mm. That's a great, that's a great point. Um, one final question, which is a short question from Ben Santamaria. Ben says, are there particular films you're planning to make next or fantasize about making next? And uh, Ben also says, thank you for this stunning talk. <laughs> Well, yes, I have fantasies. I have fantasies about, about you know, making um, 
Fast and Furious 13. <laughs> but I mean, if I had a car chase, it would be two cars going very, very slowly, which is not funky and it's not foot tapping. Um, yes, I have I have those fantasies all the time. But that's precisely what they are. But the, ne the, the, the next one, I've just done an adaptation of a wonderful book by Stefan Zweig mm -hmm. called The Post Office Girl. I mean, he, as you know, wrote the novella Letter from an Unknown Woman, which is the greatest film about unrequited love. Um, so I'm doing... I, I'm hoping to do that next year. Mm, great. So we wish you um, all success with that. Um, Thank you. We, we have had uh, uh, almost an hour and a half of your time. <laughs> extremely generous of you. You're welcome. Um, before we wrap up, I just um, have a, a, a couple of thanks that I want to um, give. I want to say... Um, thanks to Duncan Bruce at the NFTS, our alumni coordinator, who's been working behind the scenes to make tonight possible. Um, and I'd also like to thank um, John, John Taylor, your manager, Terence, who's also, as ever, been um, a huge help in putting this together. Um, obviously, okay. thanks to everybody who joined us, but my greatest thanks, as always, Terence. Such a pleasure to talk to you, and thank you very much oh, for being with um, us. You're more than welcome. It's lovely to see you again. Bye-bye. Take care. Until next time.